Good evening, everyone. You think saying good evening is pretty easy, but I had to remind myself 20 times, don't say good morning. That's like rookie mistake 101 when you do evening church services. <laughs> I just want to start by saying thank you so much to all the people that came from really far away. You know, we have people who came from as far as Colombia, and I, I really just appreciate it. And so thank you. And uh, if you came after we started, please make sure I get to at least say hi to you before you leave because I love you guys so much and I appreciate that you showed up. So let's just start with some prayer. Father, you know what it means to stand here. And I will never understand the gravity of what I am about to do. I am so honored to teach your word because it is life to those who will accept it. Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit would invade this place, that you would open up the heart of every single person here. I come against any form of distraction. I come against offense, anger, confusion. I pray for a spirit of peace to be in this place. I want to make room for your Holy Spirit to do whatever he wants to do, Lord. I just want to be an open and willing vessel. There's nothing that I can do in my own strength, Lord. But I I give you my weakness, and I ask that you take it and you make it something worthy of you. In Jesus' name, amen. So, uh, there's a lot of new faces in our church today, and a lot of people here today know me, and i um, very excited. I have family, I have friends, I have coworkers. I even have some professors of mine in here. Uh, I haven't taken homiletics yet, so don't judge my preaching too hard. Uh, don't grade me badly. <laughs> but most of you know me to some extent, some of you more than others. But what some of you might not know about me is that I didn't really grow up in the happiest of homes. Um, I had a father who didn't really love me. My parents, they struggled to have kids for a really long time. And when they finally had me, my father was really disappointed that I wasn't a boy. And although I tried everything I could to show him that I was just as great, I thought at least, <laughs> it wasn't enough. And I lived in a home where my father was very distant. He would come home from work. He left really early in the morning, but he'd come home from work and he'd go straight into playing computer games. I'd see him for a little bit at dinner time. Um, but other than that, I didn't really interact with my father very much. But when I did interact with him, most of the time, the experience was not very pleasant. He was. Um, emotionally and verbally abusive to myself and my mother. And um, it, it wasn't a very great environment. But <clears throat> if things weren't bad enough, my father eventually cheated on my mother and they got divorced. And a few months later, he landed up marrying the woman that he had cheated on my mom with. And if that isn't bad enough, I didn't grow up in a wealthy home. Um, I didn't realize it as a child. My mother really sheltered me from the reality of the situation. I realize it now as an adult. But um, money was really, really tight. And uh, to put it in, in perspective, McDonald's was a luxury. Like, that was a special occasion that you went to once, maybe twice a year. And 
man, was I thrilled. <laughs> um, so if you know me, you know I still love McDonald's today. And I'll stand by them, man. I don't care. You can judge me. I love McDonald's. <laughs> they have the best fries. Don't care. <laughs> yeah. And, um, but my mother, knowing that, you know, we, we didn't have a lot of money, she wanted a, a better future for me. And so she had saved up money, more or less from when I was born, because she really wanted me to go to university. She wanted to kind of break the, the cycle. Most, if not all, of my family had never been, um, you know, to any form of higher education. And so she'd been doing that, you know, since I was tiny. And when my parents got divorced, my dad stole all that money. And he went and bought a gaming computer for the son of his new wife. And if that isn't bad enough, very shortly after that, my dad just disappeared. Um, could not find him, could not contact him. And of course, that meant the child support stopped coming in. And eventually, it took a while, but eventually my mother managed to find someone to track him down. And we managed to get him to come to court and I had to testify against him in court. And I was ready. Like, <laughs> I'm not nervous to speak my mind. <laughs> and, and I want to just preface what I'm about to say with, I wasn't Christian yet, okay? So in preparation, I wrote this letter, slash poem, slash rap. Uh, <laughs> I was extremely into hip-hop back then, like, a lot. And I loved Eminem because he was so mad at his parents. Mom, not at you, just Eminem was mad at his parents. I was just mad at one parent. And um, he just had a lot of songs about how much he was just angry and he hated them. And I was, like, taking his lyrics and I'm, like, changing them here and there. And I'm spicing them up. And I'm just going to express how much my dad sucked in that court case. And I, I took that letter and I was ready. And I thought, man, when that judge gives me an opportunity, I'm just going to let it rip. And everyone is going to see how horrible he is. And we'll get justice. So I get to the court case. Don't even remember what they asked me because I was, I was there to read my letter. So I answered their questions. I was snarky when I needed to be to make my dad look bad. And then finally they finished asking me the questions. And so... They were about to dismiss me, and I said, uh, sorry, Judge, do you mind if I read this letter? And she said, has it got anything to do with the case? And I was like, well, no. And she's like, well, then, sorry, you can't read it. And <laughs> I remember walking out of that courtroom enraged. I just wanted an opportunity to show everyone how terrible my dad was because I wanted justice for myself and I wanted justice for my mother. Now, I don't know everyone here. I don't know everyone well. But I'm guessing at some point somewhere in your life, at least once, but probably way more than that, you have wanted justice. Either for you for someone you love, and sometimes even for someone that you have never, ever met before. You'll hear a story of someone far off and you'll be moved and it will make you a little bit mad and you'll think, that's wrong. In preparation for the sermon, I spent a lot of time Googling crime statistics and uh, proper judicial language because Stephen a lawyer was going to be in the room today, and I was really worried that he was going to miss the point of the sermon because he was going to go, you used the wrong terminology. <laughs> uh, I hope I don't get it wrong, Stephen. I'm trying. But I was asking Google a ton of questions, and some of them were a little dicey. I mean, I was asking it, like, innocently, but I said to my husband, Eric, I'm like, a little worried the FBI might come knock at the door. Like, you're asking some really strange questions, but... Um, I'm sure you can imagine Googling crime statistics. The information I found wasn't exactly nice. 
So I'm going to share a little bit with you. Um, unfortunately, 2020 was the most recent data. The government is a little behind. They had a little notification saying, yeah, we're behind. But So this is the most recent I could get. In 2020, approximately 50% of all murder and homicide cases were not solved. Only 30% of rape cases were closed and a dismal 14% of burglaries. So let's put that in perspective. In 2020, 50% of murderers were not caught. 70% of rapists are still walking around, free to do whatever they want. And 86% of burglars are still not identified. And that's the ones that weren't caught, right? <clears throat> we're not even talking about the ones that were caught, but then because of some glitch or um, mishap, they were released maybe early, or maybe you know, they thought they were behaving well and they let them go, but then they actually ended up doing even worse crimes than before. And so again, I started researching this and trying to find out you know, some stories, and I read a bunch, I'll only share one, uh, again, in 2020, there was a man who was accused of rape and abduction. And it was just as the pandemic started. And uh, he was supposed to be held in jail because he was a dangerous person. But his lawyers had argued, you know, it's coronavirus is out. It's really dangerous for him and the inmates to be close to one another. Can't you just rather place him on, like, house arrest until the case? And so... The judge eventually said, okay, it's fine, as long as he remains confined to his house. So they let him out, released him on bail. But he, of course, didn't stay at his house. And he went out and murdered the woman who was testifying against him, who was his rape victim. And then you have the stories where actually an innocent person was sent to jail. And then we find out later when it's too late. Their lives are already ruined, even though we release them. Now, if you're a normal person, you should be experiencing a, a certain amount of rage or righteous indignation. And even if you're not feeling it right at this moment, I'm sure at one point you've read something in a news article and your blood just boils. Because there is something in us as humans that wants justice. We want what is fair and right and true and just. Until the gavel of judgment points in our direction. When it's our actions, our thoughts, our motives, our deeds that are being judged, then suddenly, we're not fighting for justice anymore. And instead of pleading for justice and, yes, give me justice, we say, no, please, I want mercy. Don't get me wrong. The need for justice, the one for justice, is a good thing. It's a human thing, and, and it should be like that. We should want justice. We should advocate for justice. We should. And, and this ideal is a, is a wonderful one. And it's an ideal that I actually find comes up in a lot of conversations with my atheist or agnostic friends. They'll say to me, Cassandra, if God is good and just, why does he allow so much suffering and evil in the world? Anyone else heard that question? It's a decent question. I would say it's a valid question. But I'd also say it's the wrong question. The question is not why does God allow so much evil in the world? The question is why does God allow so much evil in you? When you do something wrong, when you lie, even if it's a white lie, 
and you steal, even when you think it's insignificant and no one will notice, even if it was when you were five, when you gossip about someone else in church or at work, when you're filled with unrighteous rage for no reason and you take it out on an innocent person, when you get drunk at the office party, when you sleep around, did, did God force you to do those things? Or did all that evil come out of your own heart? You see, the reason there is so much evil and suffering in the world is because we live in it. The world is full of billions of yous and billions of me's, all making countless thousands of bad decisions that contribute to the overall wicked state of humanity. My favorite preacher has this saying. He says, I'm not the prophet or the son of a prophet, so I'm going to use it. I'm not a prophet or the daughter of a prophet, but I'm going to guess that the vast majority of you are thinking, Cassandra, there are bad people out there. <laughs> I'm not one of them. I do some bad things. Okay, I'm, I'm not going to lie. But overall, I'm a good person. By whose standard? Your own? We've just established that you have a broken moral compass because you want justice for everyone outside, but you want mercy for yourself. Not to mention the fact that you continue to do bad, evil things over and over, even though you know that they're bad. So can you really trust your own moral judgment as to whether or not you are a good person? Since there's only one morally perfect being in the universe, let's see what he has to say about whether or not we are good people. Romans 3, verse 10 to 18. <clears throat> there is none righteous. No, not one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. They have all turned aside. They have all together become unprofitable. There is none who does good. No, not one. Their throat is an open tomb. With their tongues they have practiced deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways. And the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. There is none righteous. No, not one. God's answer is that no one is a good person. Jesus himself reiterates this in Mark 10, 18, when he says, no one is good, but one, that is God. Now, I would be foolish to think that everyone here today cares about what God has to say. Some of you might not even follow the Christian faith. So what would you care about what an old religious book has to say about whether you are a good person or not. So let's do something people don't usually do in sermons. Let's forget about theology for a few minutes. No Bible, no Jesus. Just logic, just reasoning. Let's say that it is possible for you to be a good person. You can be a good person. Well, how do you determine that? Is there a scale? where like way over here is really, really bad and way over here is really, really good and there's some middle point. 
And as long as you're more on the good side, you're a good person. Well, what if, here's the middle point, and you were right here, just made it. You're a good person. But then you do one more bad thing. Are you not a bad person? And who's the person who determines what the middle point is anyway? Is it 150 bad things? 200? 20? And you would say to me, Sandra, this is ridiculous logic. It's obviously not a number. It's a proportion. As long as I proportionally do more good than bad, I must be a good person. Okay? Let's let's run with that logic. So... Let's say that you, from the moment you were born, were a perfectly moral being. You never did anything wrong. You were kind, benevolent, generous, a philanthropist. Everyone looked to you for guidance. You never made one mistake. You never did anything wrong. Except one time. Just once. Once you did one bad thing. But, not just any bad thing, the worst thing that you could possibly do. Now, I don't know what that is for each of you, so I'm not going to give you an example because you might think, oh, that's not so bad. So whatever is the worst thing that you could imagine a human being doing, right? I know you have someone in your head right now who you're thinking about. What if that was your one bad thing? So bad that if people found out you did it because you've been keeping hush-hush because you want to be a good person, If they found out they would write textbooks about you, be like, look what this guy did, look what she did. That was a horrible person. So one bad thing, because you see there's proportions, right? So that's like, what's that, a fraction, 0.0001%? Are you a good person? And be careful how you answer, because if you still say yes, all the bad people you were thinking about, they're good people too because then no one is bad. And then we should just let everyone go free, open the jails, let everyone out, let everyone do whatever they want, because as long as you do at least one good thing, right, at some point, you can't be a bad person. Because according to that logic, no matter how bad the bad thing was, if you did it, it wasn't bad, so we're still good. You see the problem with this system of moral justification? is that we don't even hold to this in the secular world. Let me illustrate this with an, with an example. There's a guy, pretty average dude, maybe like you. And reasonably good guy, ask his friends, ask his mom. They'll be like, yeah, he's a good guy. But one day, just one day, gets in his car, goes to a club, gets drunk, drives home under the influence. That's not the bad part. Well, that's not the bad part I'm getting to. (laughs) On the way home, a single mom and her two-year-old daughter driving home. It's late. It's been a long ride. But they're driving home, trying to get home safely. And he misses the red light, and he slams right into that car, killing both the mother and the child. They go to court. And right before the judge brings down the gavel and says, you're guilty of manslaughter. He says, wait, 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 judge. I have something to say. Okay. okay." "Um, I have, I I just want you to know, I have never stolen anything in my life. And the judge goes, so? He goes, "Um, I also want you to know that that." I'm a pretty wealthy person, but I have given probably around $4 million now uh, to charities from all over. The judge goes, what's your point, sir? He says, well, also, I've been totally faithful, faithful to my wife our entire marriage. I obeyed my parents. I honor them. And I got straight A's in school. And the judge goes, Sir, what has this got to do with your case? He goes, okay, 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 judge. I'll tell you what. If you let me go, 
I promise that I will spend the rest of my life, every minute of it, fighting against human trafficking. I will quit my job, I will take all my savings, and I will put everything I have into abolishing this evil act. And the judge says to him, Sir, it doesn't matter what good you have done or what good you plan to do. The fact is, you committed a crime and you must be held accountable for it. So the man goes, I'm sorry, judge. I'm really, really, really sorry. I didn't mean to do it. I'm not usually like that. And the judge says to him, it's good that you're sorry, but your remorse does not erase your guilt. You must pay the penalty of your crime. You see, even in a flawed human judgment system, we would not let someone go because they were sorry over what they did. We wouldn't let them go if they had done good things in the past or if they even planned to do good things in the future. If that judge, that same judge, had let that man go after he said, oh, I'm sorry, judge, what would have been your response? In honesty, if you'd read that online or in the newspaper, what would have been your response? My guess is you would have said, that's an unjust judge. And you might have even taken matters into your own hands and started to lobby for him to be removed from his position. Isn't it ironic then? that what we would consider to be unjust in a human judge is the very same thing we want God to do when he looks at our sin. We expect him to just overlook all our evil deeds and just pardon all our transgressions like nothing ever happened. Now, again, I can't read your minds. But I would guess you're still thinking, what kind of emotional manipulation is this? Because of course murderers and rapists and traffickers are bad people. Of course they deserve to be punished. Of course the judge shouldn't let them go. But I am not like them. I have never in my whole life done anything remotely similar to that. You're telling me. I shouldn't have mercy. I shouldn't be let go because I've done these tiny little things. I am not as bad as those people. I have not done what they have done. And maybe you haven't. I don't, I don't know all of you that well. But maybe you haven't. Maybe you really haven't done anything like that. But you see... <laughs> This is where, again, our human reasoning and judgment fall short. Let me illustrate this again with a story, which I can't take credit for, but I don't remember where I heard it. <laughs> Let's say one Saturday afternoon, you're sitting at your kitchen table and you are bored, really bored, kind of lying down on, on your arms on the table and You're staring at this potted plant in the middle of the table. And inside the the pot, there's these little pebbles that you've used to decorate it. So you take one of the pebbles out, got a bit of a sharp point. And so you, while you're lying on the table, you start to scratch into the table and just itch your initials into the table. It's an old table, hand me down from grandma, who cares? It's not even antique, it's some knockoff, right? So you scratch your initials in, and as you're doing this, like your stomach starts to gurgle, and you're like feeling hungry. I think I'm going to go get something to eat. So you get up, and you start walking down the street, going to get some food, and on your way, you see this broken down, dilapidated, falling apart building totally abandoned, has been for many years. There's weeds growing up the side and it's rotting and the the roof is falling apart. Um, And you see a stone and you're like, whatever. So you pick up the stone and you throw it, right? 
hits the glass, shatters on the floor, but the window was already broken. No one's there. It's been abandoned forever. Stomach gurgles. Carry on walking. You're going to your favorite taco place. And it's the whole town's favorite taco place. Everyone loves it except the preacher who hates Mexican food so much. But otherwise, everyone loves it. Especially the police officers because they actually have a a precinct that's right across the road from the Mexican police. So they often go over there to have lunch or dinner if they're working late. You don't really like police officers. So you get there, you're gonna go in and get your taco, but you see a bunch of police vans everywhere because everyone's there for like dinner time. No one's around though. And you're like, you pick up a stone again, and you go up to the back of a police van, and you check. You know, no one's looking, and you scratch. Not too small, not too big. I was there. Had to keep a PG at church, right? <laughs> so you go in and you get your taco, and you walk out. On your way home, you pass this event center, and there's a big event going on that night. And it happens to be an award ceremony for like the district's best lawyers. And so the parking lot is just full of gorgeous cars. But there's this one car that really stands out. It's a brand new Lamborghini Huracan, latest model. And you're just like, I can't resist. I hate lawyers too. So you walk up to the gravel lot I mean, it's perfectly situated right there by the wheel. You pick up a stone, you find a nice sharp edge, you stare at that car, and with all your might, you stick that stone into the left back side of that Lamborghini, and with all your strength, you drag it along the side of that car, sending a shrieking noise against the parking lot as you go across. And then you stand back, and you admire your work. A thick, dark, super noticeable line across the entire left side of that car's bright yellow paint. In all four instances, did you pick up a stone? In all four instances, did you damage something with it? Now let's say you were caught doing all four of those things. What do you think your punishment would be for each of them? I'm sure we can agree that the consequences of defacing the police van and the Lamborghini would be much more severe than your grandma's table and the abandoned building. But why? In all four instances, you picked up a stone and you damaged something. But you see, the severity of the offense is not so much derived from what you did, but who you did it against. It's the same reason me lying to Rachel isn't a crime. But if I lie to a judge, it's considered perjury. Who we sin against matters. And here, here is our biggest problem. Because every sin we have ever committed has been against God. King David understood this. For those who don't know the story, King David, generally great guy, spoken of really highly in the Bible. Lots of blessing, lots of mercy. God really, really loved him. Go read it. However, he did one really, really bad thing. And he one day saw this beautiful woman, and he decided, I want her. Even though she was married. So he takes her, sleeps with her, she gets pregnant, and to hide the deed, 
he has her husband killed, and then he marries her to make it look more legit. God, of course, is not fooled, so he sends a prophet to confront him, and eventually King David realizes that he's done a horrible, horrible thing. And he goes to God, God and, he, and he starts to pray, and there's no denying, if you read the story, that Uriah, the husband, was wronged. That Bathsheba, the woman, was wronged. Scripture doesn't hide that. But in King David's prayer to God, in Psalms 51, 4, he says the following. Against you, you only, have I sinned. You see, King David understood something. He understood that because God is the moral law giver, any sin or breaking of his commands constitutes an offense against God himself. So let me put that in perspective. Even if you only did one tiny bad thing your whole life, as tiny and insignificant as picking up that stone, you have sinned against a being of absolute moral purity and infinite immeasurable worth. And your crime, your punishment for that crime, your sentence, your fine, has to be of equal value. But how do you provide recompense to an infinitely worthy being? You cannot. For even if all the people who ever lived, past, present, future, if they all took all the good deeds they'd ever done together and handed it to God, it would not be enough to cover the sin, the fine of one person's smallest sin because they have sinned against an infinitely worthy God who is without measure, without comparison. There is nothing you can provide as payment because nothing is equal. Near the beginning of this sermon, I posed a question that I said was a better question and I said, a better question to ask is, why does God allow so much evil in you? Why does he allow so much evil in us? But it's kind of a trick question because the answer is, he doesn't. God doesn't allow evil in us. Exodus 34, 7 says, God shall by no means clear the guilty. Psalms 5, 4 says, For you are not a God who takes pleasure in wickedness, nor shall evil dwell with you. Galatians 5, 19 to 21 says, Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, Envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Revelation 21.8 But the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Revelation 20:15 And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. We will all one day stand before the judgment seat of God. All our sinful deeds will be exposed. We will all be found guilty. And we will all be charged to pay a fine we cannot afford.
For some of you, the picture I just painted for the last 30-ish minutes is all you've ever known of Christianity. What you heard was something like this. We're sinners. God is an angry judge, and he's going to punish us for our sin. The other half of you are sitting here confused, maybe a little offended, because the God you know is loving and merciful and kind and quick to forgive. Both these groups have one thing in common. You're both wondering, why did you come to church today? Because it's been pretty awful thus far. But you see, the existence of these two groups actually points to the very dilemma that God faces. You see, if God has to just ignore our sin, if he just brushes it aside, if he extends mercy to us, how can he call himself just? But... If he gives us the justice we deserve and sends us all to hell, how can he call himself merciful and loving? Let's be honest. If you read your Bible, all of it, not just Psalms and the Gospels, you will see that God is an angry judge. He hates sin. He abhors it, and he will not allow it to stand in his presence. He will punish all evildoers. But if you read your Bible, all of it, not just the first five books, and Lamentations, <laughs> you will find that God is merciful and loving, quick to forgive, showing grace and mercy over and over and over to people who don't deserve it. How can both of these things be true? How can both of these things be true? God cannot punish us and be merciful. Give us. But he cannot give us and be just. But God, in his infinite brilliance, finds one perfect solution. See, you have sinned against an infinitely holy God. The only way he can justly pardon you is if you pay a fine of infinite worth. But God knows you cannot pay. Because there is nothing in the whole universe that is infinitely worthy. There's nothing of infinite value except one thing. Himself. And so he does. The unthinkable pays the fine for you his own life. Jesus comes. He's the son of God. He comes to earth. God in the flesh. He lives a perfect life. The one you should have, but you didn't. And you couldn't, even if you wanted to. He dies on that cross, and he had to die, because scripture tells us that one of the the parts of your fine, one of the conditions is that you must die for the wages of sin is death. So instead he comes and he dies 
in your place. Before I move on, I want to camp here because there is something that was shown to me years ago and after I heard it, it, it really revolutionized the way I looked at the crucifixion and it really impacted me. What was so bad about the cross? Especially if you're a person maybe looking from the outside of Christianity in. Right? What was so bad about the cross? Lots of people die. And many people, let's be honest, many people have suffered with worse deaths than Jesus. If we're being honest. Crucifixion is gruesome. I'll give you that. But there are worse deaths to die. So why? Was Jesus so afraid to go to the cross? And we know he was afraid because when he was in the garden of Gethsemane, he's praying to God and he's crying out and he's saying, God, if there is any way this cup can pass from me, if there's any way I don't have to do it this way, please, let's go the other way, but not my will, yours. He was so stressed by what was about to happen that he sweat blood. Now, you must understand, for a long time, no one even understood what that meant. But when medicine caught up, they found out that you can get to a point that you're so stressed that the blood vessels in your skull start to pop and blood will come out of your skin. I don't think anyone's written an exam that hard. And then we see the same thing when he's on the cross, right? He says, Eloi, Eloi, lama stabatani. He says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why did he feel abandoned? What was so bad about the cross? If you know the story of Christian martyrs, you'll hear many people who were crucified, like Jesus, crucified upside down, boiled in pots of hot oil, had skin flayed off of their bones, were thrown to wild beasts and torn apart limb from limb, were burned at the stake. And yet we hear stories that they went to their deaths singing, rejoicing, with smiles on their faces. Were they braver than Jesus? Now, if you're a Christian, I hope you would at least say, well, that's not possible. So what was so bad about the cross? What did Jesus fear? What was so bad about the cross and what Jesus feared? It was not the scourging. It wasn't the flesh being ripped from his bones. It wasn't being whipped. It wasn't having his hands and his feet nailed to that cross. It wasn't standing on that cross for hours and hours struggling to breathe. It wasn't the mocking, the blaspheming, the spitting, and the cursing that was hurled towards him. Those are not the things that Jesus feared. What Jesus feared was the wrath of God that was saved up for all humanity over all time, being poured out in one moment onto one man. That's what he feared. <clears throat> I want you to think about that. How dreadful the wrath of God must be if even God himself fears enduring it. How dreadful the wrath of God must be if God himself dreads enduring it.
but how deep the love of God must be if he was willing to suffer it for you so that you can be saved. Jesus suffers, he dies for you. Guess what? When we said he was infinitely valuable, we meant infinitely valuable. And so his life was worth more than the debt that was owed. And so the grave couldn't hold him. It had no right to keep him down because he had more than paid the fine for you. And so he rises from the dead. And not only does he buy for you salvation and pay your fine, but he buys for you a new life, new hope, and a new body in a new kingdom. One day, Jesus will return and you will get your new body and we will be in a new kingdom with him. A kingdom and a new earth that is free from sin and evil and wickedness and suffering. He could have stopped at salvation. He could have stopped at, I'll pay the fine, they die, and they disintegrate into nothing. No punishment, but nothing great either. But no, he didn't just buy your salvation, he bought your redemption. He gives back to you what was stolen from you from the beginning. You were born in a sinful body. You were born in a sinful state. It is your lot to be sinful. But he gives you a way out. He says, take this way and I'll not only save you, I will redeem you. I will build you into something more. I will make you beautiful, what you were supposed to be in the Garden of Eden. I will make you into that. I will erase everything you've done. Just look at me. Just turn to me. What an offer. What an offer. Only one question. Will you accept it? You can owe a fine to a judge. And someone can come in and say, I'll cover it. And you go, no thanks, I got it. But someone will pay the fine. Will it be Jesus? Or will it be you? This is the gospel. Some of you have never heard it this way before. Some of you have maybe never heard it at all. But now you know You can never unknow. I've waited 31 years to preach my first ever sermon. And some of you might be thinking, what a terrible choice of a first topic because it might be your last. And I know it was harsh, it was blunt, it was to the point, and I didn't pull my punches. And I promise you, I meant it to be so. I pray that your heart is cut open. If Christ was terrified, of the wrath of God, the worst thing you can do is leave here feeling nothing. I would rather you leave here angry or sad or offended, but to feel nothing is the worst thing you could possibly feel. In fact, I hope you don't leave at all because I hope that you feel repentance. I hope that you feel something inside of you that says, 
I need my fine paid. Now, what I'm not going to do is I'm not going to do an altar call. I'm not going to ask you to come and we're not going to say a little prayer right now. What I'm asking you to do is if you do feel cut to the heart, I would like you to come at the end of the service and you speak to either Pastor Adam or myself and we can speak about how do you get your fine paid? How do you make sure that you're clear on Judgment Day? Some of you haven't seen this side of me, so I apologize. But for those of you who do know me a bit more on the personal level, you're not surprised that this is the type of sermon I've preached today. (laughs) And here's the thing. For everyone in this room who does know me, when you walked in that door, did you doubt that I loved you? Have I ever made you feel like I wouldn't give my life for you. I love you because the one I love the most gave everything for you. And I would do anything, anything to take you with me to see him. I know preaching this sermon might lose me some of your friendships. but I will never abandon you like he will never abandon you. And so when you hear these words and they're harsh and they sound cruel and they sound judgmental, I hope you remember all the times we've been together where I've endeavored to show you nothing else but compassion and mercy and love and grace. And you know why? Not because I'm great, but because I realized how terrible I was. I've had some people ask me, Cassandra, why do you love God so much? I came to love God so much when I realized how terrible I was. When I fully saw myself in God's mirror for the first time. And I grew up in a Christian household where I knew all the stories and I knew all the things and I knew the prayers and I knew what I should say and I knew I should read my Bible. I was better than the pastor's son. I could take him on any day of Bible trivia. I thought I was it, man. And then one day, God held up a mirror and he said, look, you're a sinner. And when I saw myself and then looked at him, I fell in love with a person who could look at something like me and save me. Seeing yourself in God's mirror is not a bad thing. You think it will bring condemnation and shame, but it is the very thing that will set you free. The things that you love in this world, the things that you hold on to that give you hope and joy and meaning, that you're so terrified if you turn to God, he will rip it away, are the very things that are stopping you from experiencing the very thing that you want the most. It grieves my heart that probability is against me and that most of you will leave here and you'll maybe say something like, that was a good sermon and you might be lying when you say it, I don't know. But you will leave here and nothing will change. When a doctor tells you that you are dying, do you just go home? play video games, read a book, carry on like nothing is wrong. Do you do that the next day and the day after and the day after? Do you really value your life so little that you wouldn't take the time to save it? I would say no. Most of you would try to do something. You would try, go to another doctor, get a second opinion, try different medications because most of us value our lives. but why do you not value your eternal life the same way? 
You put it off. And you think, I'll do it later. I'll fix it later. I'll get right with God later. I'll answer the questions later. I'll figure out if I'm a good person later. But there isn't always a later. And I know you've heard that a million times and it's the Christian thing to say and you don't care. But it's the truth. You could die when you walk out that building. Don't walk out those doors. If you feel in your heart today that something in your life is not right with God, do not risk your soul like that. Remember, if God himself dreaded enduring the wrath of God, how can you be ambivalent and apathetic toward it? Lastly, the people in this room who thought the sermon wasn't for them and were maybe you know, pumping a fist a little bit, I ask that you examine yourselves. The Bible says that on Judgment Day, there are people who will stand before God and they will say, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not cast out demons in your name? Did we not heal the sick in your name? And he will say, get away from me. I never knew you, you who practiced lawlessness. Note what he doesn't say. He doesn't say, get away from me, you who didn't believe in me. He didn't say, get away from me, you didn't pray enough. He said, get away from me, you who practiced lawlessness. Of course, an unbeliever would have been, you know, similar statement, but he was speaking to believers. How do we know that? Because they said, Lord, Lord. Only Christians call Jesus Lord. So these are people who profess to be Christians, and they got to eternity, and they said, Lord, Lord. And he's like, I don't know you, because you practiced lawlessness. Now, that's a word that we don't really use anymore. But again, one of my favorite preachers, he explains it this way. Lawlessness is living as if God never gave you a law to obey. If you call yourself a Christian today, I ask that you examine yourself closely. Do you still love sin? Is it a burden for you to give up those things? Are you the reason there are people sitting in this room today who won't turn to Christ because they've looked at your life and said, I know what the Bible says, and you guys are hypocrites. If an outsider had to look at your life, an unbeliever, if they had to look at your life, would it look different to theirs? Or would it be identical except that you spend your Sunday evenings differently? Examine yourselves. It would be a terrible thing to get to judgment day and think that your fine is paid and find out that the debt is still due. This practice has been lost to our modern cultures, but long ago in ancient times, if someone saved your life, you voluntarily gave your life to them in service. You realize that without them, you would be dead. And so the rest of your life, you gave back to them. You're essentially a dead man walking. You should have died, but they saved you. So instead, you give what life you have that you shouldn't have had back to them in gratitude. And note, you don't serve them to get saved. They saved you, and so you serve them. And that is the call of Christianity. Scripture says, you are not your own. You were bought with a price, the highest price that was ever paid. So now go and actually start to live like it. Let's pray. Father, I know 
that this wasn't nice to hear. I know it was harsh. But God, if we can just see ourselves in your mirror, and we can realize that what we perceive to be cruel is the greatest kindness in the world. When a doctor tells you that you're sick, he's not doing it to be cruel. He's doing it to save your life. I pray that you invade the heart of every person here, that you would remove the lies they have believed their whole lives about you and about your son and about this faith that we have. I pray you won't let any person leave here who you know, Lord, is not right with you. Let them put aside their cares or concerns for what they're doing for dinner or, oh, I brought this person with me and I don't want to look weird and go to the front or speak to someone and I don't want to be exposed. Let them realize the gravity of the situation, Lord. Or when someone is drowning, they don't care about looking dignified. They just want to reach out for the nearest lifeboat. And I pray you put that same amount of passion and desperation in the hearts of these people today. And for those who claim to be Christians, I pray, Lord, that they start to live a life that is worthy of the call. So that like it says in the book of Acts, when Christians are around, people will start to say, those who have turned the world upside down have come here also. Let us look different, be different, speak different, think different. We repent, Lord, for not being an example, for not showing the world what you look like. But at the same time, Lord, Using us as an excuse on Judgment Day will not hold up in court. It won't matter if every Christian failed. Every individual will still be judged on their own actions. And so I pray that you make every person realize that, that they cannot judge you on the actions of a human, but they must just judge you for your own sake, Lord. And they must come to you as they are and bear their soul before you. Lord, I could have preached the worst message or the best message, but if you don't come and don't do what you do, it was all a waste. I cannot convince anyone. I cannot change anyone. Only you can. And so I ask today that you would come and your Holy Spirit would bring more people into the family of God. We love you, Lord. We honor you. We worship you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.